Good afternoon and welcome to episode six of International Affairs. I'm Matt and this is Jeremy with me. Hello. And we will be talking about China and Taiwan today. So, Jeremy, could you give us kind of a summary of some of the recent news surrounding China and Taiwan and what, uh, why it's been such a big, big story? Yeah, so the news with China and Taiwan has really, uh, the saber rattling from China has really started to reach this intense point lately of China kind of saying so and demanding this reunification of Taiwan into mainland China and being completely controlled uh, by the Chinese government, Chinese Communist Party. So this recent saber rattling, these military exercises that are taking place, we've got Xi Jinping conducting a very interesting peace deals and bringing other major world players together on issues that the U.S. has struggled with, uh, Xi Jinping is really uh, projecting his power and in doing that around the rest of the world is also specifically focused on Taiwan. So, it's a timely issue. It's critical and I think today... Our, my aim is to have a casual discussion on why Taiwan is important to U.S. interest, um, kind of draw parallels between China and Taiwan, what Taiwan provides to the West in terms of security and power projection of the United States in the South Pacific, and kind of talk maybe about some policy ideas or where the West goes from here based on our current position in international affairs today. Right. So kind of getting us up to speed, right. Um, China views Taiwan as this kind of breakaway province. Yeah. After the, after the communists won the, the civil war in China and the, the nationalist forces escaped to Taiwan, you had uh, the development of of two kind of separate entities de facto, but China mainland China has never recognized Taiwan as as an independent country, and even though de facto it it acts as one, right, right, and over time, Taiwan experienced a, a liberalization of its economy, a liberalization of its of its government, to where it is uh, now a very vibrant free market economy with a, a democratic government. Um, and, and this developed slowly over time. China, of course, uh, is, is anything but either of those things. Um, it is a, a one-party system uh, with, with severe government interference in all aspects of everyone's lives. And so these two systems are diametrically opposed. Absolutely. Right? And... Taiwan, therefore, represents, to a large degree, this kind of uh, democratic David versus the autocratic Goliath in, in China. And, and China, in its saber-rattling, keeps repeating a lot of this legal fiction that it's concocted about its rights vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan uh, as this so-called breakaway province, right? So... Can you explain to us a little bit um, what that means for uh, for Taiwan and what it means for us in the West? Sure. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, you have this island nation only about a hundred miles off of the coast of mainland China. You have a population of around twenty three, twenty four million people that are ethnic share the same ethnicity and the same language. They use different currencies, uh, but they there there's this ethnic tie, and Taiwan, as you alluded to, is really a thorn in the side of China because it's completely contradictory to how the way Taiwan operates is completely contradictory to how China sees their country should operate and does operate 
and China doesn't like this, this, this vibrant democracy, 100 miles off of its coastline with similar people, same language that has support of the West. And that's not good for China. And so for for us looking at uh, at China's claims, right? A lot of a lot of what China claims about Taiwan and its and its status is is clearly, as I said, a legal fiction, right? Right. It's um, it's something that you would expect, um, you know, somebody like the the Chinese government to to come up with this idea that oh, we we actually own this, even though. We, you know, nobody else says we do, right. and and right, and so, so we we can we can claim that we have the rights to this, even though you know the people don't want us there. the 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 rest of the world doesn't recognize us there. Uh, not that they also recognize Taiwan either, because China has so much political power right. that that it's not very practical for for most countries to recognize Taiwan's independence but we all kind of just de facto act like yes it's it's independent right, right? and and so how do we in the west approach this kind of delicate situation where you have the need to be able to protect a like-minded country that um, not only represents a an outpost of of democracy and political freedom um as well as economic freedom in the region but is strategically located with key shipping lanes with um and and with strategic aspects of its economy as well with the the computer chip and semiconductor industries right how do we approach this situation from the western standpoint right from the western standpoint it's a tricky situation diplomatically from our previous discussions about our uh, the affairs and relations with China and cheap labor, cheap goods, things that we get from mainland China into the United States. There's that really, really strong, deep economic tie because we've outsourced everything. With Taiwan, they produce approximately 60% of the semiconductors that the world uses and produce approximately 90% of the very advanced semiconductors that are needed for advanced scientific research and development of emerging technologies. Taiwan, from the West perspective, is that, that outpost of democracy right up against the CCP in the South Pacific, trying to think about future power projection of American foreign policy and might is a key critical issue in the region as it stands. And also what we do is we uphold democracy. We support freedom, free and fair elections, honorable government leadership. That's what we do as the United States. We support those things. And when we lose that holdout, if we lose that holdout in the South Pacific, American influence can dwindle in the immediate area. And that's negatively going to impact the West and the United States. Right. And, and we look at, at the geography of the region, right? Taiwan is kind of smack in the middle of a, a chain of outlying islands that go from Japan down to the Philippines of, of friendly countries, right? Right. And... And we have in that area kind of a, a good spot to be able to project power and to be able to, you know, protect freedom of the seas and, and free movement of goods and, uh, and trade, right, in the region. And if China is able to block that off, right, what does that do for, uh, for one, our, our image in the world, and, and two, how does that affect the global economy. Sure. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I was reading a lot. I wish I could attribute it to whoever wrote it. Speaking of Taiwan being a bellwether, uh, if Taiwan, as far as what it means, what it, what the West will be perceived as 
if Taiwan goes and how China is going to perceive being able to effectively take Taiwan. It would it, certainly be emboldened, wouldn't it, it? It's emboldened. And so there's this grand strategy at play that I think is important to focus on. There's also, as we zoom in, there's this geopolitical tension and then there's immediate strategic relevance to Taiwan and U.S. power projection and foreign policy in the South Pacific. Taiwan is not able to defend themselves. Taiwan needs Western support and defense. And so the question comes up, do, why not just let China take Taiwan, right? There are Taiwan being its very, very strong and vibrant diplomatic, not a dem democratic outpost, also serves as a very important strategic deterrence position for us in the South Pacific. And so when we talk about American interest, our foreign policy, our power projection, how the West is going to look, how China can become emboldened by uh, taking Taiwan, there are a lot of major issues at play, and it's critical that we focus on the strategic importance of Taiwan from soft power projection to immediate strategic uh, power projection militarily in the region. It's, those are critical issues. Right. So... So clearly the, the power projection and, uh, you know, the ability to exercise uh, diplomatic leverage in the region and promote uh, freedom of the seas, free uh, freedom and trade, as well as promoting a, a strong democratic country, uh, as well as free market economies, right? And, and it's just its physical location, right? It's clearly a strategic spot that, that impacts our ability to... Uh, deter and defend against Chinese aggression in in the near future, right? So these these examples that you've given uh, show why we don't just want to let Taiwan go, right? Right. And with Xi Jinping's recent comments uh, about you know Taiwan being reintegrated with China um, by force if necessary. Uh, what do you see as the as the possible uh, future? Is he just saber rattling? Is he serious? Is he um, you know what is he trying to do with these kinds of comments? Yeah, I don't think he's just saber rattling. I do not. I think it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. I think uh, conflict in Taiwan is imminent, and China. China's clear about what they want and what they're going to do. Their military drills as of recent clearly show that they're intent on taking Taiwan. They want to do it expeditiously. They want to have it planned perfectly. And I don't see anything... I don't see what's going to deter China mm -hmm. from taking Taiwan. We have uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, meeting with Xi Jinping recently and coming back from that meeting saying Europe needs to second think getting too tied up with what American foreign policy objectives are outside of Europe. And, that, and that's kind of typical Macron fashion, right? He, right. He's done that with Russia. He's done that now with China. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but it it it's important, you know, to see this decline in great support and great partnership, even if it's just in what's publicly communicated to the mm -hmm. rest of the world, right? Whenever there's fractures that start to develop and leak out into international media about leaders of powerful developed countries saying warning we should really not maybe follow the united states lead on this i think you know xi jinping ccp 
they see it, they watch all of it. Mm-hmm. They and they take, love it, and they love it. They love mm-hmm. it, and you know, I think it also, you know, Taiwan's watching what's happening, and mm-hmm. it, it worries them. And so now we're having to give extra and additional reassurances to the Taiwanese government every day as we move on in this thing that is about to break loose that we will support. And we told them we will support 100%. Mm -hmm. And so that means... Even militarily, uh, if if necessary. And and what do you make of that, uh, of these comments? Um, Are we, you know, is our promise credible? I think our promise... Our absolute promise, I think, is credible. I think there is this gray area of in diplomacy where the support is promised and our intent is to support. But what what happens when the American people no, no longer. longer support, mm-hmm. right? Then government can't continue on and keep their promise. So we have a similar situation with Russia, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's what are the American people willing to tolerate and support? And what will the voters do? And what will the voters do? So I think any administration that comes in knows that China is a significant threat and we have to counter all of the moves that China makes. China is going to move on Taiwan. We're preparing for that now. And whenever it comes down to it, we need to really stand strong and do what we have to do to to defend Taiwan, which is going to be significant. Mm -hmm. And so, and then we get drug into deeper conflict with China in all of the other places that China operates around the world that we also operate in. So I don't know, I don't know what to make of all of it Mm -hmm. other than I think China is going to move on Taiwan. We've promised our 100% support. Other countries are starting to waver and waffle. Mm -hmm. Are we going to follow the U.S.'s lead on Taiwan? And so that means, are we going to be at it alone? Right. And and is this maybe kind of a a Munich moment for uh, for Europe in Mm -hmm. in that uh, in that context? Because. I mean, strategically speaking, Europe is is far less concerned about Taiwan, with the exception of the Lithuanians, who have been kind of stalwart uh, supporters of Taiwan. But um, you have uh, you have kind of this sort of oh, it's it's far away. It doesn't matter right. which which is something that we kind of see here sometimes whenever we look at at a a country like Ukraine as well. Um, and so this is uh, this is a big issue for for the public perception of of what's what's going on. Now, looking at all of this, if China is emboldened by what's going on in the scenario we see here, where we have fractured leadership um, in the West, uh, perhaps even weak leadership um, in in different places, right? Um, and and we've signaled at times our own weakness on issues related to Afghanistan, related to um, you know the the Ukraine crisis as it was beginning, right? And and yes, we have improved in that scenario, but we did too little, too late, uh, in in my opinion. But um, you have at at this point, right? If China does choose to take military action. What does that look like? You know, how does that end? I don't think it would end quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think if China takes military action against Taiwan, it's going to be swift. Taiwan relies heavily on imports for energy. It's an island, a complete blockade, um, and closed off airspace around and over Mm -hmm. Taiwan. And they've practiced trying to do these things. They have. Recently. Uh, They have. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's going to completely suffocate Taiwan's ability to function as they function today. And it's a major problem. And so the West, 
the United States is going to have to provide significant support to try to counter military action and military action between two superpowers, China and the United States, is going to be bloody, bad, disastrous conflict Mm -hmm. that will not end quickly and it will spill over into all other things and affairs. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be good. No. But, but I, you know, I think China is emboldened in their current position to do that. I think we appear weak. And so this will be a defining moment for the United States, major defining moment, what we do with Taiwan after we've promised that we would support and back Taiwan 100%. Can we still deter the Chinese, or has that ship sailed? I think we can. I think there's a small sliver left of our deterrence capability regarding the Chinese. They know we're serious, I believe, in what we're doing and saying. They've seen a stall out with supporting Ukraine. They know that we're aware that we've stalled out and that we have an issue and that we're changing things here at home to better our capabilities, better our diplomacy with other countries. And I think they're taking that into their calculus that You know, Russia acted at a prime opportune time. We've had a little over a year to make some changes. And so I think our power projection and deterrence projection or deterrence strategy is improving, but we're still seen as way weaker than we should be seen. Mm Mm-hmm. And and so this is uh, this is a major major problem and and what we what we see in these times and something that I like to drive home to uh, to my students whenever I'm teaching history is you know when other nations perceive the United States as weak they are emboldened to be aggressive against their neighbors because right. they know that we will not respond in full and this really creates a a world uh you know again i hate to use the phrase world system but in kind of international affairs jargon right we we regularly refer to uh, the way the world operates as as kind of the world system um we end up with a much more unstable system that is uh more highly prone to conflict that's not just localized between you know a civil war in uganda or something like that you know, it, it becomes a, a much bigger uh, issue around the world. And this creates, you know, a, a greater sense of danger, not only for other people around the world, but also for us. Because when we are perceived as weak, then we get dragged into things that we never wanted to begin with. Get World Wars One and Two, Great. right? And, and so this kind of gets to the heart of of you know why it matters right so we have all these shipping lanes uh, around taiwan right we have the question of chinese ability to project power into the pacific we have the the strategically important uh semiconductors and com- computer chip industries right uh we have the issue of of the safety of democratic nations uh and and support for democratic nations and we have the precedent that our actions one way or the other will set. So how, you know, we can see from those things, right, why it matters. Uh, but why does that matter to the everyday American? Right. Yeah. It matters to the everyday American for many reasons, but what the everyday American is going to feel immediately are economic impacts and, 
American soldiers potentially getting sent home in body bags. Uh, Taiwan matters. If microchips, if, oh, this goes back to our China discussion on how we have outsourced everything. Mm-hmm. Yep. After and, after Nixon and Carter in the 1970s, we, we opened up to China, and China just started making everything. And, 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 we, we, and we let them do that. Uh-huh. Um, and so, and it, Taiwan specifically is this really high-tech manufacturing hub, electronics, sophisticated microchips, integrated circuits that are used in American electronics. That supply chain is relatively secure. If we no longer, if if Taiwan is no longer a free and open democracy and that supply chain is tainted or manipulated, disrupted one way or another, disrupted one way or another, then we, we will not have new electronics like we see now that are readily available. We ran into that just logistically with COVID shutting Mm -hmm. everything down. You know, auto manufacturers couldn't produce new vehicles because they didn't have the microchips that they needed. Uh, A significant issue. And so, and that even opens the door for, uh, for Chinese espionage activities. If the Chinese communist party is able to take control of that industry, Right then, it can manipulate what goes into those those chips right. and those semiconductors. Right, and that's what we cannot let happen. And so that is part of the American strategic interest in Taiwan as well. Sophisticated military hardware uses these advanced microchips that really are only produced in those highly skilled, advanced factories. In Taiwan, we do produce some here, not enough. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's, it's there's a story after story of already counterfeit chips being found in sophisticated military hardware and equipment. And so, not letting China have access to that supply chain is critical. And again, when it comes to military hardware, that means lives lost as well. Right. You know, something doesn't function as it's supposed to, and you know, your, your troops are sitting ducks. Right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so the, that's the impact everyday Americans are going to feel first. If China, if we just let China take Taiwan and didn't respond at all, we're going to feel that, that squeeze on microchips. And then there are going to be trickle down effects of tainted microchips being placed into electronics that are sophisticated and we will start bleeding even more information than we are now to China. If why it matters to the everyday American, if we do defend Taiwan, we'll keep that supply chain safe and secure. We'll still produce innovation and technological advancements through the skilled labor and these highly sophisticated factories in Taiwan. But there will be a cost to the U.S. military and personnel in defending Taiwan, which we will feel. Mm -hmm. Money spent, lives lost, to fight for a small island 100 miles off the coast of China with people that have close ties to China. So... It's going to be hard. The, the effects that are going to be felt by Americans here at home are going to be delayed and whatever happens, you know, unless China completely sets up a, a naval blockade and sets up combat air patrols and closes down the airspace over Taiwan, you know, it, the effects will be delayed in what we feel here. And so I think the American people need to think really hard about what support we should provide when we, when we should provide it and be cognizant of acting now is going to prevent greater catastrophe in the future. Right. And looking as well at, um, 
the the ability for the Chinese to project power into the Pacific. That's um, you know, lest we lest we call to mind again the war in the Pacific from World War II, right? As the Japanese were able to get island after island after island in the Pacific, that put us closer and closer and closer in their range. And and the same scenario could happen militarily speaking with with China as well uh, in in that kind of situation. Yeah, so, and if there's no pushback, why they're not going to stop? Exactly. If there's no pushback, they won't stop. And exactly. They and, see it as a moment mm-hmm. of limited pushback. Now's the time to act on Taiwan, take Taiwan, then move on to the next. Exactly. It it presents that that perfect opportunity uh, for them in in this, and that really uh, shows that you know maybe democratic nations need to have stronger leadership to be less vulnerable and and need to have a higher tolerance and willingness to uh, make good on you know promises of of military support and uh, and be willing to fight right because when we're not willing to fight then we are are vulnerable right it comes down to good leadership good leadership um and good leadership prevents war. Good leadership prevents war. And I think there's been a severe lack of good leadership mm-hmm. around the world. Yes. Um, I don't know if as our civilization moves on, there's a complete loss of intelligence that's slowly did to decay that's slowly taking place. I don't know what's going on, uh, but... We're definitely distracted, if nothing else. Right. And and on top of that, the uh, the Chinese and the Russians are actively promoting our distraction, mm-hmm. and so uh, this is uh, this is of course dangerous for us. Yeah, and I, another point I want to bring up, you know, the the most immediate major conflict in recent American history that we dedicated ourselves to, really, this fight on terrorism. Right over the past what twenty three years, mm-hmm. it's waning now. That fight and what the American people and their recent memory understand war and conflict to be is what they witnessed us fighting non state actors overseas. That uh, I don't know if I uh, uh, I don't know if I would not call them sophisticated because. Some of these groups are very sophisticated, but limited funding, limited support groups that are spread out, similar ideologies, different tactics, different things that they were primarily focused on and interested in, a different kind of war. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about the United States and Taiwan and China, this is something that we have not seen since mm-hmm. World War II, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, along with it comes the threat of, of you know, both the United States and China are nuclear powers. Right. right. And I think I heard recently that, you know, the assessment is that China has more nuclear warheads now than the United States possesses. I don't know if that is true. In fact, how, how do we, we let... We have fallen behind um, in in terms of our our nuclear deterrent capabilities. Um, we've followed a lot of limiting treaties, uh, which which we had set up between us and Russia and and other powers, and uh, and the former Soviet Union. Even some of those treaties that had kind of extended past that that line, we kept following these treaties, and of course Russia didn't, and China wasn't a partner to them right. anyway. And in, in most cases. And so you have, uh, so we, we were naive. Yeah, we were naive and, and we have allowed that part of our, our arsenal, uh, to kind of decline. Yeah. And, and for, for us at this point in time, right. We had a brief, uh, period of renewed seriousness about the issue, uh, during the previous administration, and I'm not sure exactly where that's gone since then, but uh, that is a major problem for us at this point, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, nothing I say ever is 
focused on specific people, the rank and file, diplomats, intelligence officers, military command structure. But it's as far as American foreign policy goes, this naivety that seems to persist is baffling to me that we are not more cunning in our understanding and approach of how the world really works. China is going to cheat on on treaties. China is going to violate whatever agreement. Mm-hmm. Right. If the they Russians can get away and the Chinese it. are not good faith actors. Right. They're not going to do what they say they're going to do. They're going to find the loopholes and find the ways around. Right, so at what <laughs> point do we... You know, I know... Our country's integrity is important, and that's part of the United States that we project. That's part of what makes us great and what makes us strong. But how do we work around that that issue of not being naive? Mm -hmm. And... And just because a treaty exists on paper doesn't make it to where we're actually safer. It's got to be to the point that you can verify and say that the other side is actually following along. Right. And if there's no good way to say that they are really following along, or if you know that they're cheating, then why did you sign it? Right, <laughs> yeah. right. Or why do, then, then why do we not start cheating as well? Because mm-hmm. we should. If they're cheating, we should cheat. Mm-hmm. That's the way I see it. And, and at the end of the day, uh, what, what we have found is that we are in a position where they don't take us seriously. And, and that is the most dangerous thing, is that they don't take us seriously. And that will embolden them to take whatever action uh, that is aggressive right. in, in various theaters around the world. And the, the more that they're emboldened, the more dangerous and more insecure the world is right yeah yeah what do you what, what's your take on what china might do with taiwan and if they do it do you think we will back it up so my take at this point on the issue is is i fully expect a a full naval blockade um they're capable of doing it they even have aircraft carriers that look remarkably like our ford class carriers right right um you know, they're capable of doing it. On top of that, you're going to have continuous air support. You're going to have, uh, you're going to have essentially, the way I look at it, it looks a lot like a, a kind of blitzkrieg with an amphibious landing component to yeah. it. Um, it's going to be a swift, shock and awe, massive campaign. And essentially you're going to have this sort of repeated strike after strike after strike after strike. Um, On top of that, because of the blockade, they're going to try to prevent any foreign military personnel from being able to enter. Uh, It's also going to prevent energy imports, so it's going to create blackouts. It's going to create confusion. It's going to disrupt communications. Um, and, And all of this in some total is... Uh, a, a disaster, right? For for Taiwan, and it looks, you know, by by sheer numbers, like it ought to be quickly overrun. And so, and how, so this, how do we deter? So how mm-hmm. does the U.S. deter that credibly? Then how, yeah. how other than good question? You know, <laughs> right? Even if even if we are mm-hmm. credible in saying our ultimate deterrence is our nuclear capability. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Does that mean right. launching nukes into mainland China? Right. And, and that's, that's a big question. What does that look like? How do we have a credible deterrent? Can we get people there faster to reinforce Taiwan? Um, can we, you know, if we can't do that... I don't then, think we can. Exactly. I don't, I don't relate either. Uh, if we can't do that, then what can we threaten China with that is more valuable to them than Taiwan. And, you know, are we, you know, do we have good enough leadership to identify what that will be? Certainly there are people in our, in our intelligence community and in our diplomatic communities in our military uh, who would have those answers, but will anyone listen to them? Right. Right. 
and and from there you know if we if we do that uh, what is the consequence of it, right? Is that consequence something that we are willing to accept? Uh, or, you know, what is, you know, what is the least bad option? And, and unfortunately, we've gotten ourselves into a scenario where just about everything we do with China is, you know, what is the least bad option? All right. the options look terrible, right? right? You know, what, what is the most palatable one or what is the one that's most likely to achieve the greatest success, whatever that looks like. And, and so is it something to do with our nuclear deterrent? Is it something to do with our, our, uh, naval power projection in the, in the region? Is it something to do with, uh, economic impact? You know, whatever that is, right. We need to be able to make that approach. And, you know, Looking at this, it may require even a multi-pronged approach um, to be able to project enough power to prevent China from from doing this. But um, like you, I'm kind of pessimistic right. about uh, about that situation. I think you know there may be a very narrow window of opportunity, but to to kind of turn this around, yeah. But uh, it doesn't look good. Right. It yeah does not, and we're going to be watching it. Mm-hmm. And trying to analyze the data as it comes and piece through all the parts of the puzzle. Not really a puzzle. There's two pieces, Taiwan and China. Guess the third, what we're going to do if we do mm-hmm. what we say we're going to do. So Taiwan is important to the American people. It's important to the West. It's important for our power projection in the South Pacific because we want to counter Chinese Communist Party's way of life, the way they govern, the way they operate. And prevent it from subjugating people elsewhere, because, including here. Right, that's, and that's what they do, subjugate people. So that's why Taiwan's important. It's a timely issue. It's changing day by day. Uh, and all we can do is pray for no conflict. and. Wisdom for our leadership. Wisdom for our leadership, absolutely. Even if it has to smack them on the head. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but that's China, Taiwan. Is there anything, there's a lot that we could add to all of these episodes as we talk and, and kind of dig deeper into what's happening. But is there anything specific that you would like to add, Matt, on Taiwan, China? At the, at the end of the day, um, the biggest thing that I could repeat again and again and again is strong leadership and a strong deterrent prevent war. Weak leadership, lack of will, distraction, these all create a more unstable environment and and lead to more war. So we have to be willing to show strength in order to promote peace. And at the end of the day, that's going to require some sacrifices. Um, so that's something that, as the American people, we have to look at very, uh, very seriously, uh, and we have to pay attention to who we vote for right. and uh, and what they believe in when when we do. Right. So. Those are, those are kind of my final thoughts. Do you have any final thoughts as we wrap up this episode? I don't have any final thoughts. We're going to watch it day by day, see what happens. And then maybe we'll start a uh, additional video playlist of kind of circling back to specific current events in some of these major topics that we've covered. We've, Matt and I have been trying to cover some of the major geopolitical and strategic ideas and areas of interest in international affairs, those being espionage, China, Russia, Russia, Ukraine, conflict, military conflict. We've got China, Taiwan. We're going to keep talking about additional issues, things in the Middle East, things energy, 
going to talk diplomacy, about diplomacy, diplomacy, terrorism, all run the gamut of topics, right? Outer space, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, sp- yeah. Maybe space law. Is there law in outer space? I don't know. Law on the seas, right. all, all kinds of, all kinds of different issues. But I think we need mm-hmm. to circle back around as mm-hmm. some of these current events that we talk about as they change, maybe have smaller little episodes about mm-hmm. What's happening and right. kind of our current take on that. Specific events, certain concepts that, that we might bring up, but maybe we don't have time to to explain in full in a, in a regular full-length episode. Uh, and I want people to ask mm-hmm. questions. I want people exactly. to go on our YouTube page, like it, subscribe, ask questions, and we'll work those into our episodes. And... And we'll give you the best answer we have. The best answer we have. <laughs> Matt and I know a little bit about foreign policy and international affairs intelligence and we'll try to answer your questions so that's it china taiwan it's important just like everything else but it's a critical pressing issue today and we'll keep watching it and try to bring you guys some later info analysis intel as we get it thank you for watching this has been episode six of international affairs covering China and Taiwan and what that looks like for the rest of the world. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share to, uh, to all your friends. And always, uh, we're, we're open to questions in, in the comments as well, and we'll try to answer those as best as we can. Yeah. Do you know how to say goodbye in Chinese? I don't know in Chinese. I can say it in Russian, obviously. Okay. I don't know Chinese either, so yeah. we'll just say it in English. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> До свидания. <laughs> yeah.